Back to Closer Broke. My name is Kieran, and today is a really, you know, important day. Why is today important? You may be asking. Today is an important day because it marks our hundredth episode of the Poker Vlog. It's kind of a big deal. Two years of doing this, a year of doing it seriously. Hitting over a hundred, you know, videos is a big deal. It's taken a long time, and with 80% of those videos being edited and made by myself, produced, it's been a lot of work. The only way this all happens and the only reason I keep doing it is because you guys continue to find a way to support me, whether that's liking, commenting, and subscribing. Either way, I feel forever indebted to you guys. Again, thank you. And today we have a really big day. Traffic was a little bad as, you know, I live here in LA, things like that happen. Let's hop into today's session. I'm super excited to get into it. More importantly, guys, stay until the very end of the episode. I have something really important to share with you guys and I uh, hope, hope you guys like it. It's going to be worth it. Just hang in there. Welcome to the game. Welcome to Bally's Presents Live at the Bike, the world's longest running high stakes poker series. This action is coming to you from the beautiful Park West Bicycle Hotel and Casino in Los Angeles. My name is Yale Greenfield. You can find me on YouTube at Live King Poker. And I'm partnering today with a poker legend, Zach Elwood, the author of Reading Poker Tells, Verbal Poker Tells, and Exploiting Poker Tells. Thanks for joining me today, today, Zach. Thanks, Yale. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Good to be here. Good to be on the. And just like that, we find ourselves in the biggest cash game of my entire life, looking to fend for what is rightfully not ours, but we got to earn it, I guess. Anyways, we're going to hop into this very first hand and setting the precedent, setting the tone early. Dr. H decides to open it up here from the button to $175. We're playing shorthand at this point, I think six or seven handed. We look down at queen seven of diamonds here from the small blind. I'm going to play this aggressively, going to go ahead and three bet to $550. I'm out of position, so we got to make the price of poker a little more expensive. Our opponent decides to make the call, and we're going off to a flop that comes king, five, seven, rainbow. I do flop a pair here. Seems like a pretty easy spot to continue betting here. Don't need to go massive. I end up making it a third of the size of the pot, $375 to go, to which my opponent decides to fold. If we're going to be three betting these suited little 15 gappers or whatever, I'm going to be playing them aggressive. My intention in this session is to play aggressive to allow myself to get paid when I make big hands. Moving right along, find ourselves in a situation where plus one, I believe this is Dr. H, decides to limp in here. I'm directly to his left, and I decide to crank it up to $220 after I look down at pocket deuces here. Again, a little wide here, but I'm going to be isolating, you know, where I see it fit. Only the limper makes a call, and we're going off to a flop that comes 997 with two hearts and a club. You know, not a great flop for my range. It's okay for my exact holding, I suppose. But when the opposition checks over to me, my hand can use some equity denial, so I decide to bet $300. In this instance, I think it makes a little more sense to go smaller here, but either way, it is what I do, and our opponent makes a call. We're going off to a turn card that comes with seven of clubs. At this point, my hand is shriveled up into a very not pretty third pair that has been counterfeited. I now have two high. I'm, my hand's horrible. I have literally the nut low. When the opponent checks over to me once again, I decide to bet pretty massive here, though. 
I think that betting a little bit on the bigger side would get ace highs to fold that are floating. And moreover, I think I can represent, you know, pretty credibly a hand like aces, kings, and queens. At least that's what I'm thinking in real time at the moment. Unfortunately, my opponent does not like that, and he decides to raise to $2,100. As you guys can see here, he has ace eight of hearts, a very aggressive action for my opponent. And luckily for him, I have the nut low bottom of my range. I'm going to go ahead and fold this hand as there's nothing much to do here. We're going to have to give our chips over to our friend Dr. H. The action folds over to me, and for the most part, the table has been pretty slow and passive. So I'm going to take advantage of that and get my button range a little wider than expected. King 8 is not really that wide, but we're going to go ahead and raise here. King 8 offsuit from the bottom when it folds over to me. Only the big blind makes a call, and we're going off to a flop that comes 9-7-5. I don't flop a pair here, and it's not all that great for my range. Although I do flop a gut shot, which is, you know, pretty helpful. The one thing that we will obviously have to mention is that it's very important to say when a hand or a range, like this, these things don't correlate. The board texture is not great for my range on the button. Again, I'm going to be fairly wide here, but it's going to be more favorable for the big blind than it is me. Either way, the action checks through. I don't have a spade to my hand and the turn card comes an ace of spades. At this point, I just remember that one of my whole cards was black. So I'm going to pretend like it's a spade and feel like that is what I'm representing. When the action checks over to me, I'm going to go ahead and take the reins of the hand here and bet for $200. My opposition decides to make the call and we're going off to a river that comes a queen of diamonds. When the action's checked over to me, I feel like I can't go massive here. There's no reason to polarize myself. Going somewhere in the realm of two thirds pot or half pot seems reasonable. I think I can still credibly have ace 10 or pretty much any ace in this range here. So I decided to bet $450 as a milky value looking bet. My opponent, luckily for us, snap folds jack seven. So he folded second pair on the flop. Good for us as his hand shriveled up by the time the river came around. And just like that, we're taking another pot in our direction with a pretty reasonably timed bluff. By this point, some time has gone on and not a lot of things have really occurred. We've bet some flops and taken them down. We've got some raises with aces that just don't get any calls. So we're looking in a pretty interesting situation when under the gun by the name of Eric decides to raise to $300 as because we now have the $100 straddle on. And it's pretty much going to be a constant for most of the session. So just beware. The stakes are getting massive, really big. Folds all the way to me, which I am in the straddle. And we look down at pocket jacks. This is a great situation for many reasons. Most importantly, that I can have a three bet here that's not junk. We now have a value hand. I go ahead and make it $1,100 because I am out of position. To be quite frank, $1,200 probably makes more sense as that we are out of position for the entirety of the hand. Either way, we're going to go ahead and get called from our opponent. Out of position, heading to a flop that comes 844 Rainbow. Pretty outstanding flop for our specific holding. The only thing that we do have to mention is here... It's very unlikely for our opponent to be hitting this flop. Besides pocket eights and maybe one or two combos of ace four suited, I think for the most part, my opponent's going to have nines, tens, ace queen, ace jack, and ace ten suited. If that's the case, I got to go really small here. The pot is around $2,300. I'm going to go for a third or fourth size of the bet here. I make it $800 to go right in that perfect sweet spot. My opponent decides to make the call. As you guys can see, he has ace queen here. He's floating with just ace high, and the turn card is a miracle jack of clubs. We were ahead, but I mean, for me at this point, I don't know his holding, obviously. I've now got to target what I believe is a flush draw or an overly bluffed situation. I think by checking here, I allow my opponent to really take over the reins of the hand, and I show a ton of weakness. My hand's like ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, king queen, king jack, all pretty much give up here and possibly float depending on his sizing. So I decide to tank check it over to him. He takes the bait and bets $1,500. Obviously, I think raising would be a complete misplay of the hand. So I think about it for a moment before deciding on just making the call. The river is a beautiful five of hearts, changing nothing to the board texture. I have the effect of nuts in my heart. And at this point, the only possible way I make any more money is by deciding to check it over to my opponent. And as you guys can see, that was the perfect play, or at least in this instance, it was. Like I said, I, I let him hang himself, and he does, to the tune of an all-in. Just shy of $5,000, we beat him into the pot. I let him know immediately that we do have ourselves a set of jacks that turn into a beautiful boat on the, on the turn here. The biggest pot of my life, that was it, right there. 
and it's uh it's, it's really fascinating to see it back in real time unbelievable i'm overwhelmed in emotions but i'm keeping my poker face on Seventeen thousand american u.s dollars shout out to inflation as uh, i don't even know what that's worth now but man what a sight to see that was an absolute barn burner i find myself under the gun plus one looking down at pocket nines and by this point we have a fully stacked game of eight-handed poker play I reached to $150, the button who's been pretty snug up to this point, goes by the name of KGB, decides to 3-bet to $400. The big blind cold calls, and we're going to go ahead and make the call here, can never be folding this hand. We're going off to a flop that comes queen, 3-5, with two clubs and a spade. The action continues in flow as we check it over to the person in position. The 3-better decides to C-bet for $600. It folds back over to me. I think folding to one bet would be a little nitty to say the least so i go ahead and make the call here obviously i don't realize that i'm behind i think you can be doing this with this entire range ace king ace jack ace 10 queen jack king jack we're going off to a turn card that comes an unbelievable nine of spades wow. bang nice kieran red hot today twenty five hundred dollars in the middle i think betting somewhere in the realm of 50 to 65 percent pot seems like a reasonable situation some people, and you can hear it in the comments, or excuse me, in the commentary, they're saying that it's a little odd to lead out on this turn card. Now Kieran's taking the lead on this no, turn. Don't you have that head? Water in your area. What? Would you have that head? All right, ace eight. What? How did you? You cannot have had me on the turn. I think you had, I thought you had like a nine, but I guess you had a queen. Uh, I guess the eight seems. Huh? No, you're good. KGB's gonna call here. <laughs> you're definitely good. The eight saved me. I was gonna oh, call you, but. Oh. Is the jack tank out there? Hi. Right now? Hmm? <laughs> no. Yeah. KGB getting put in some some tough spots. Hit that. Uh, oh, Eric hit that three outer on him earlier here, and then this hand little. Run a little bad in a couple bots. Yeah, interesting line by Kieran there. Probably somewhat non-standard to lead the set, but Kieran's a smart guy. He comes with a lot of... Uh, he just shows people a variety of lines, and I think, therefore, from a behavioral point of view, they tend to have a trouble reacting to them because he does try so many different lines on people. In that instance, KGB just had a hand that kind of had to call the turn at least once and then decide river. And KGB did decide well on river. I'm going to go ahead and say that it's easy to think that when you can see our opponent has queen jack here. But I think that leading on this turn is important. I'm going to have a ton of suited combination holding here that consists of jack 10 spades, jack 10 of clubs, king jack of clubs, king 10 of clubs, king jack of spades. There's a ton of suited combos that I'd like to be going bet bet with and to most likely jam the river to get a fold or to get max value. By not betting this turn or not leading this turn, you're, in my opinion, never leading enough with bluff or value. Unfortunate for us, we can get max value, but maybe a small size on the river, like 1,000 to 2,000 it gets called. Hard to tell. KGB has been playing fairly solid, but pretty snug. So, you know, either way, we'll take the pot. To be quite honest, to this point, it still hasn't hit me. I'm playing 25-50-100. I have $25,000 in front of me, and I'm playing in front of the most lively commentators and, and the crowd i guess i don't know it's weird because you guys are virtual but the comment section in the live stream was unbelievable i got to check in randomly and you guys were really bringing the fire and the intensity that i needed to really help me get through this session all that being said it's it's it still hasn't even hit me yet this session is is it's come and the anxiety is not even there i don't even have the time or the ability to be anxious I'm so focused on playing and really showing out for you guys. Anyways, in this next hand, the hijack was his Dr. H decides to raise to $175. We look down at 6-4 of diamonds here next to act. I'm going to go ahead and 3-bet here in position. We don't have to go very large here. I make it $500 to go. Only Dr. H makes the call. We're going off to a flop that comes ace-9-5 with a diamond and two spades. We flop ourselves a ton of backdoor equity and a fairly decent range advantage here. The nut advantage, as some may call. My opponent does the unthinkable, though, and decides to lead off for $325. This just exudes weakness, in my opinion. 
I think that he should never be doing this with a really strong holding. Fives, nines, aces, ace king, ace queen, ace jack are probably never doing this. So I end up making the call with really mischievous and devious intentions on the turn in the river. The turn card comes at 10 of clubs. It doesn't add any equity to my specific holding, but again, it does help out my range a little more. Sure, he can have 10-9 suited here that I guess decides to lead, but when he decides to check it over to me, I think we can pretty much credibly discount that for the most part. I decide to check it back considering my range probably doesn't have a bunch of three barrels. I think I have a bunch of two, you know, bet value hands or two streets of bets of value hands. Anyways, we're going off to a river that comes a seven of diamonds here. That would have been a much better turn card. I probably would have bet that one as we would have picked up an open at a straight flush draw. Either way, we've come to the river with the worst hand we're ever going to have. Luckily for us, our opponent decides to check it over to me. There's about $1,700 in the middle here. We've got to be betting to get some of that money. You know, we, to me, that's free money. I bet $1,300, and luckily for us, my opponent pretty quickly folds king high. Very interesting lead out from Dr. H with king queen. I'm happy we were able to sniff that one out and make a really decent bluff with six high. It would not be a close to broke vintage session if I didn't have a ton of randomly crazy played hands or some big bluffs. If the six high hand wasn't crazy enough for you, maybe this one's more enticing. In this next situation, J Scoops is on the button and decides to raise to $400. As you guys know, J Scoops is a friend of the vlog, a protagonist, an antagonist, excuse me, that has been involved in the Commerce 2040 80 session we played recently, as well as the Bike Private session. So we have some actually background with him. He decides to raise the button like we mentioned. I'm in the straddle with Ace Jack Offsuit. This plays better as a three bet, but I think considering how crazy he can get post flop, I don't mind just playing this as a call sometimes. So I end up doing it just that. And we're going off to a flop that comes seven, do six with two hearts. I decide to check it over to him. He makes a C bet for 500 bucks, pretty large here. I'm going to go ahead and make the call here with our float. We have a back door and a flush draw and two overs. Never going to be folding this flop. The turn card comes as six of hearts. Not bringing in that front door flush, obviously, and giving us the opportunity to draw out to our nut flush. I decide to check it over to him, and he decides to have a double barrel for 1,400 buckaronis. That's a pretty big sizing here, and I'm going in between just calling and raising. What are the merits of a raise here? I think if I raise, I can definitely get hands like 8s, 9s, 10s, and sometimes jacks to fold. And more importantly, hands like ace-king and ace-queen that are just double barreling here can fold as well. If that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and play this aggressively, and if I do happen to make our flush on the river, it's not very likely that I can get called on the river unless my, ha my opponent has specifically the king of hearts. Either way, we're going off to a really aggressive play from ourselves, raising it up to $3,600. J Scoops pretty quickly makes a fold. As you guys can see, he had a pretty bad hand. He had ace four spades. Very interesting double barrel by him, but I'm pretty happy with the way we played that hand there. Obviously, because I have a fairly reasonable experience and play time with this opponent, I'm able to pull off some kind of interesting moves like this. Either way, going to be taking our chips here and raking in another big pot. Probably a helpful image to... That's a good name. Yeah, I'm looking for and I'm looking forward to look, he's the big winner so far in the game. And we've seen him run it a couple of times, although he's run it when he's ahead, so he's turned the best hand into a bluff a couple of times. And I'll be interested to see how he uses that image Here's your, uh, going he's your, forward. He's got your favorite hand. Though maybe yours is, is your favorite soft suit. No, that's a Live King's favorite <laughs> hand right there. You're hundred percent right. <laughs> At this point in the session, uh, something interesting happens where the small blind, who's Dr. H, decides to raise to $225. Very, very interesting because the straddle is on. So this is like a 2.25x, which has not been what Dr. H has been doing so far. Anyways, I look down at Ace King of Hearts directly to his left. Not sure what to make up of this raise sizing. And on top of that, the straddle being super aggressive pre-flop. He's been three betting me a ton. I think I should use this as a back raise option. So I end up deciding against my better judgment and just going with the flat call. This does invite him to make the call with that amazing price he's getting. So we're going three ways off to a flop that comes King, King, seven rainbow. Absolutely picture perfect. You could not have made it any better. This is the epitome of how we've been running today. Dr. H decides to lead out here from the small blind for 275 bucks. I make the call straddle folds. We're going off to a turn card that comes with five of spades. Now at this point, there's about a $1,400 pot, and the opposition decides to check it over to me. I've got to start betting for value here, but if I bet anything too big, I feel like it's most likely that my opponent's going to fold. So I decide to bet $200, going one-seventh the size of the pot. Dr. H thinks it's pretty comical and decides to make the call. 
We're going off to a river card that comes a jack of clubs. Slightly less hands that I can beat here, you know, like 1% of hands. Jacks as well as king jack improve. Either way, I'm not too worried about that when he checks over to me. I'm going to go full size pot here. Don't know a ton of bluffs I'm going to ever have here, but you can't really worry about that. I got to bet when I think my opponent has something strong enough to call. I'm putting him on hands that include 10s, 9s, 8s. And if that's the case, again, just because I have some prior experience with Dr. H, I feel like he has the propensity to make a little bit of a weaker call. Anyways, after a bit of thinking, he decides to make the fold. He folds queen seven, so he did flop himself two pair. I flop trips. Looks like a raise on the flop might have worked a little better in our favor. Either way, we're going to go ahead and chip this pot up. Let's go. Moving right along here, not a whole lot of four or five betting pre-flop, even though we're playing 600 big blinds effective here. But this next, you know, hand definitely breaks that little bit of a streak. In this hand, we look down at Ace Queen of Diamonds. The straddle is on to 100 bucks, and we're playing over $20,000 effective. I decide to raise here to $300 from the button. And again, as we mentioned previously, Eric has been really prone to 3-betting me at this point, and he has not given up the 3-betting train. He decides to 3-bet to $1,200 from the small blind. The action's now back on me. And considering how strong my hand is and how weak I think my opponent is, I'm honestly for betting with the opportunity and the likelihood and the understanding that I'm calling all five bets. It may seem crazy, and again, you can see his hand, but at my time, I cannot. I just have the intention to three bet, four bet, five bet. Well, we're going to get it all in. That's my point if I have to. It seems ridiculous getting 300 or whatever, 150 big blinds in pre flop with ace queen, an unpaired holding, but I just have a read on my opponent, and he's just shown the propensity to three bet very light. Either way, I end up making it $3,200 for the 4-bet, and he goes deep into the tank. He's going back and forth, and I think more than anything, I've given him a pretty decent price to just call. I didn't even make it 3x. Moreover, I think that he's considering a 5-bet. As you guys can see, he has ace 7 of clubs, so we're praying, hoping that he puts it in there. I'm never folding. He has around 13 k to start the hand. Either way, my opponent ends up making the pretty easy fold, I feel like, after a long bit of tanking. Again, shipping another really nice size pot in our direction without any showdown. It may not seem like it because I've run so well here, but I don't have the best seat in the house. I mean, it's running hot. We can't complain about that. But two people that are very prone to three betting me are three betting me very often. So it kind of handcuffs me a little bit, making me play a little more tighter when I'm first in to raise pots. Either way, this is a good example. As I look down from the plus one position at pocket jacks here, I decide to raise it up to $300 with the straddle onto 100. The cutoff, who's a stronger player, Ashin, or Ashin, who's also Indian, I'm probably misspeaking your name there, forgive me. He decides to 3 bet here with King Queen offsuit to $1,100. It folds over to J Scoops in the small blind, and he decides to 4 bet to $4,000 with the action now back on me. I mean, although I think J Scoops is very capable of making some plays here. For this specific sizing of 4x, I'm just never going to make the call. We're playing way too deep. I think it'd be horrific to get all in preflop here for a $60,000 pot. I'd rather just play a little more, you know, passive here and a little bit tighter. I end up making a pretty easy fold for, for me, I guess. And it seems like it was the right fold as J Scoops picks up pocket aces there. Yeah, that felt nice to get that out of the way. Uh, yeah, I can't complain about that. It seems like we're just dodging bullets, baby. White magic. In this following hand, it folds all the way over to Wayne here, who's the host and the production or the producer of the bike. Shout out to him. He was a you know quite a bit of a good time and a wonderful pleasure to have. It was really nice catching up and understanding his background into StarCraft or what he mentioned, some gaming stuff. Either way, folds to him. He's playing around $1,300 from the small blind. I'm in the straddle. He jams for $1,325. Folds to me in the straddle. We look down at pocket eights, never folding. We make the call. He asks if we can run two boards. Seems great to me. First board, we flop a set. And if that's not enough, overkill time as the turn comes the eight of diamonds. Bing. We hit ourselves quads. Outstanding situation. Now, the only thing is I've got rid of all my outs. So we're hoping to pick up another pot here. Going once again to a turn, or excuse me, a second flop. That comes jack seven. He flops two pair with his jack seven. And turns a boat. So I guess quads and boats. We're just dealing out these crazy flops here. And that's going to be a chop pot. And everyone loves a chop pot. But I had to put it in there. We flopped quads or turn quads. Excuse me. Who can complain about that? That's just literally 
doesn't paint a better picture than that as to how we've been running in the session. For everyone that's made it to this point in the video, I want to thank you guys all dearly. I'm going to ask you guys to do me a massive favor by clicking the like button down below, making sure to drop a comment on your favorite hand so far, as well as letting me know how you guys are doing today. Again, stay to the very end of the episode, not only for even more ridiculous hands that we're about to go into, moreover, we're doing a really big giveaway as a thank you to everyone that's watched, subscribed, and been super, you know, hanging out with me through this journey. Either way, this very next hand is a very interesting one as we're, there's a straddle on and Dr. H from Under the Gun opens to 325. We're next to act with pocket aces and considering how many people are behind me to act, I do have to size up a tad bit. Don't have to go as big as 4X, but somewhere in the middle of 3 and 4X seems fine. I make it $1,100 to go with the American Airlines pocket aces. No shout out to American Airlines as uh, they have a pretty crummy loyalty system. Anyways, don't need to go down that tension. It folds back over to Dr. H who decides to make the call. We're going off to a flop that comes 654 rainbow. It is very, very important to learn how to mix checks here on these board textures. I have pocket aces. I'm literally not worried about any turn card really. Um, I'm going to call even if a seven or a three comes on the turn, I have to call at least one bet. So I can't be worried about that. And the other thing I should mention is that the ranges are fairly narrow here. He can have the nut advantage on this board. I'm never going to be three betting with sixes, fives, or fours. Maybe seven, eight suited sometimes from early position, but more than likely he has those hands. So I'd rather check to play some pot control, which I do. Check it back. And we're going off to a turn card that comes of four back. spades. Karen checks back pocket aces. Tough board for aces, really. Now he's going to start firing with his aces up. I expect Dr. H to call at least one here. I'm going to go ahead and bet here for value. I bet $1,000 going fairly small into this pot of $2,400. Going less than a half the size of the pot. Even $800 would have probably been better. Our opponent decides to make the call here. We're going off to a river card that comes another four. We now make a top boat. This is a beautiful sight to see. Even more so when my opponent checks it over to me. At this point, I start thinking about sizings, and I feel like considering the perfect bet that I made on the turn to set up a one-to-one -one stack to pot ratio jam on the river, I end up jamming it all in. Zach drills it. We got Kieran all in with pocket aces here. $4,500 to go. My opponent's the effective stack, and he goes deep into the tank. Dr. H has been known to make a pretty reasonable fold in the past, but he's also known to overcall in these spots. Either way, by jamming here, I put my opponent in a bind. And moreover, I think that my opponent has a hand like 10s, 9s, 7s, a bunch of random holdings like that. Either way, after a brief tank, my opponent ends up throwing in a time bang chip to extend his timer and eventually making the call. Another massive pot shipped in my direction, nearly a $14,000 pot. I've played my first and probably second or third biggest pot of my life tonight, and they've both gone in my favor. That's just the epitome of what it's like playing live poker in LA, I guess. Things just get big fast, and uh, today I was just running well. We have a couple more hands here against Jay Scoops that we're going to go over. We're going to hop right into this. The straddle is on. The cutoff limps. Jay Scoops is on the button, and he makes it $500 to go. Folds to me in the small blind. We look down at ace-queen offsuit. Again, this is a hand I should just be like three betting like nearly 99% of the time. But at this exact juncture, considering how short KGB was, you know, considering how big me and J Scoops are playing at the at the time, me and J Scoops are the only people with like 30K on the table. And that's something that's important to know. That's it, it just is a lot of money. I don't need to pretend like like this is not. It's a ton of money. And considering there's a straddle on, sure, it's only three 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 hundred big blinds, like only, but it's just, I'd rather play a little cautious here. And moreover, it's just, it is nice to have a just flat with a hand as strong as this. Anyways, I make the call and the initial limper folds. And we're going off to a flop that comes king 5-3 rainbow. I check it over to my opponent in flow. He bets 400. We call. Seems pretty standard. We're going off to a turn card that comes a seven of spades. Check it over once again. There's a full rainbow out there. And he decides to bet 1,000 into 2K. This is where things get a little tricky here. Besides specifically hands like king jack, king queen, Ace King, not a whole lot to be worried about. It's hard for a hand like Jacks or Queens to go for two streets of value with my cold call from the small blind. So his range is honestly very narrow, even though his bet size isn't indicative of a polar range. By betting two streets here, I think he's fairly narrow. So I have to call these one time to keep him honest and a second time to keep him even more honest. 
We're going off to River that comes a 10 of diamonds. I check it over to him. 4,000 in the middle. He decides to put out a third barrel of $2,800. And uh, yeah, just another three, four size pot bet, like some of the neighborhood 65%. I go into the tank before eventually succumbing to the fact that it's just unlikely for my opponent to go three barrels here as a bluff. It's unfortunate because, again, his range is just very narrow at this juncture. I end up making what feels like to me a pretty disciplined fold. Again, it's easy to see when the cards are up. Luckily for us, we made a good fold as he does have King Queen here. And uh, yeah, just like that, we're moving on to the very last end of the session. We've been able to really dodge bullets today. And last but surely not least, we find ourselves once again in the same entanglement against Jay Scoops, who decides to reach one of the gun to $400. I find myself once again in the small blind, and I, again, once again, just make the call. The thing is, when you're under the gun here, it makes it a little trickier. Ranges are a little tighter. So, again, just playing a little more passive here as the, you know, the session winds down. The straddler calls as well. We're going off to a flop that comes 5-3-3 rainbow. Jay Scoops decides to see bet for $500. We decide to make the call, and the turn card comes the six of diamonds. Once again, a full rainbow board texture. I check it over to him. He decides to check it back. So at this point, I know he has ace-king, ace-jack, or ace-10. The only time he's ever checking back here is if he has some form of showdown value. We're going off to a river that comes the queen of clubs. At this point, I'd, I'd rather polarize myself betting near the size of the pot or as close as I can get to it. I'm not going to have a ton of bluffs here, but I know that, you know, he's going to have ace high. It's very unlikely for him to call up a bet anyways. Even if I bet like three, five hundred dollars seems ridiculous. You know, he might be able to fold for that anyways. And I think by polarizing myself, it gives me a chance to make the most money. I bet eighteen hundred into twenty three hundred. He thinks about it for a moment and jokes about saying that I could be bluffing with the best hand and makes the fold. And just like that, our miracle session, our amazing run good, our sun run of a session comes to a close. And uh, yeah, I can't, I feel great. And there's no way around that. I don't know how else to put it. I feel great. I feel lucky. And uh, let's throw it over to me a couple days after to see how we feel and uh, see if we've been able to let it all settle in. Thank you guys again for watching. I appreciate you guys very much. Okay, so... Welcome back to one of these like little more personal things. As you guys saw from today's episode, it was uh, it was insane. I got slapped by the deck. Take it with a grain of salt. It's easy to pretend like you play really well when you're just running really well. I do feel like I played well. I got some really nice bluffs through. Six high bluff was nice. We just did a really good job of having a good idea of what the vibe was. All that being said, today culminated into the largest win of my poker career, which is a big deal to me. It, um, it's always weird to think about that I was playing like significantly smaller stakes some time back. And now I'm comfortable enough in whatever lineup I'm in for the most part that uh, that I can, you know, make a little, little, little bit of change. Why did I want to sit you guys down in a personal atmosphere? Because this is a big deal. It's a big number. We were into the game for 12,000 and out for, up. you guys saw the graphic at the end of the video, but I think just shy of 32K. It was like, maybe it was like 31 something, 31,775. That's very helpful for the WSOP, obviously. I'm not playing 25, 50, 100 very often. That was the biggest stakes I've ever played, the biggest win I've ever had. And one of the longest sessions we put on in a little while, we played for six or seven hours. Uh, I think the longest session before that was the Hustler stream and then the bike private game that we played some time back. Well, I'm gonna do a $500 giveaway. I think we're just gonna give away a hundred bucks to five different people. It's pretty easy. All you're gonna have to do is comment on this video. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. And if you guys would go above and beyond, make sure to like and uh, follow me on Instagram, which will be, you know, a link right here or in the description. It's really simple. I'm gonna give away 500 bucks. It's, it's the very least I can do for the unbelievable amount of support. But it'll be to five different people. Again, like, comment, and subscribe if you guys haven't already. Make sure to turn on the notification bells if you haven't as well. And again, just a massive thank you from the bottom of my heart. This time around, I made sure to really do my best to mention it to friends and family that I was playing. And uh, I, I could feel that. I could feel you guys' energy behind me and it made playing so much easier. I just, I felt like I just played so well that in that session. Anyways, that's gonna do it for today's video. I, I can't thank you guys enough for the support. This is a really big deal to me. A really big deal for my family even uh, for the supporters for close to broke as a community and as a family i love you guys i appreciate you folks so much thank you so much for the support i'm so excited to show you guys what we have in store hopefully you guys enjoyed the bankroll challenge which was on monday expect some more fun videos this friday and as well as next monday we're gonna have the bankroll challenge episode two thank you guys as always i bless your guys' souls thank you so much for stopping by and i'll see you guys on the next one stay happy stay healthy more importantly we're gonna the tables y'all deuces <laughs>